season's greetings, bird nerds. I'm Grant Williams. This is the Bird Emergency, and this is an episode that I have been teasing for a long time. It's the poo episode. It's the episode not about birds, but about those that predate birds. It's a story of resilience. It's a story of how you get things done in a state of lockdown and how cooperation between different agencies, different groups gets things done. I hope you enjoy this. I really wanted it to be part of the summer holiday listening that we 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 enjoy this time of the year here in Australia and I presume in other parts of the Southern Hemisphere with our summer. For those of you in the Northern Hemisphere, you can still enjoy it. Pour yourself some mulled wine, sit in front of the fire. And coming up after this episode, in the next uh, week or so, in this New Year period, I'm going to be dropping out some, ber- some episodes that are not really about particular birds or particular projects, but Uh, about the tenacity and the dedication that some people show towards preserving birds, which is why we're all here. Now, at the end of this episode, I'm going to recommend a couple of other podcasts or other places where you can hear some, I think, shows that you will enjoy or find useful the bird emergency today i'm speaking with robin sinclair and i came across robin on twitter just mentioning a little bit about his project and an an interesting encounter that he that he had with an an unwell a poorly owl in the suburbs of melbourne and we got talking and i thought he had a really interesting project going, even though, Robin, you're going to be the first. Not, I, I think everyone I've spoken to so far is is in a PhD project or a postdoc project. Welcome aboard. You're based in Melbourne. So tell me and tell everybody what your project is and, and where you're doing it because that's a pretty amazing place. Yeah, I'm doing my honours year at Deakin University, supervised by Ewan Ritchie and Hayley Gale. And I'm looking at the foxes and feral cats out in the Grampians National Park out in Western Victoria, specifically looking at the diet of the foxes and also looking at the effectiveness of a new feral cat control measure being trialled in the park this year. Now, that's pretty timely because at the risk of dating the podcast, which I generally don't like to do, but only yesterday the news came out that the Environment Minister in Australia has opened an inquiry into the effect of feral cats, prompted, I think, by the research of Sarah Legg, which, which I'm really looking forward to the, to the outcome of that review. But perhaps some of the work that you're doing may go into that review. Do you think that you'll be far enough along with your results when submissions are, are being called for? I don't think we'll be quite ready to share anything yet. I'm sure there'll be some people putting in some submissions about the newly developed curiosity baits and what their uses might be. So it'll be really good to see that discussed in and around Parliament and hear some responses to that. Before we talk about the specifics of the program, you're working in the Grampians, so just give us a bit of an outline about the why the Grampians are so important. It's a little bit interesting, actually. Because of coronavirus, I haven't actually been out to the Grampians this year, so it's not an area I've actually visited. But the Grampians is this beautiful, spectacular area of mountains in Western Victoria, and it's an incredibly biodiverse area, hundreds of native species. Uh, several species of plants that are only found there, lots of endangered mammal species particularly, which the foxes and cats put at risk. For quite a few years now, they've been working there to tackle the threat of foxes. This year, they'll be tackling the threat of cats for the first time, at least on a large scale. 
And it's just a really important biodiverse area in Western Victoria. You haven't been out there yet, but what's the shape of the of the project? How? Well, let's go back to the very basics. What data do you collect? How do you collect it? And then how do you assess it? Yeah, so there's two parts to it. To look at fox diets, what we're doing is we are collecting fox scats, so fox poo from the tracks and trails all around the Grampians. We're lucky we've got Parks Victoria staff are helping us out with that since I'm not able to get out in the field at the moment. And we're going to send those off to a scat expert who will pick through those and using the hairs and bones um, and bits and pieces they find in that, tell us what the foxes in the park are eating, which will give us a really good indication of which species they might be threatening and which species might be helped by fox control. Then to look at the effectiveness of the cat baiting, what we're doing is we're putting out remote motion sensing cameras in the park. So these go around, some along the roads and tracks in the National Park, some a bit further out in the bush, and they are triggered by movement. And when a fox or a cat goes past the camera, it snaps a picture, uh, tells us when and where that was taken. And then we can look through that and see whether there's a change in the places cats and foxes have been seen before and after baiting has occurred. So you'll be able to see where they occur. Are you able, do you think, will you be able to draw any conclusions about the population uh, density or the actual raw numbers of the populations? Sadly, not with this setup. So uh, the predators in the Grampians have been monitored for a few years now using this camera setup. Um, and it actually was originally designed to complement a small mammal monitoring program that's being done by some people at Deakin and some others. But you can look at the population numbers of cats by looking, identifying the patterns in the fur of the cats. But for that, you need to know the home range of cats in the area you're working in, so how far they roam, and then your cameras need to be set up so that they match that area, those distances. And sadly, we don't have that information for cats in the Grampians, and that would require going out and probably putting radio collars on cats and tracking their movements. But that's something we haven't been able to do yet and would be a really great area for future study. Is there is there a way to use some of the information? Because I'm guessing that there's been work done in Australia with collars on cats. Are you able to extrapolate anything from studies like that and then combine it with what you're doing? Yeah, so we did have do have some good knowledge of, I think they've done some of that work with cats out in the Otways, for example. So that's probably the closest we would get to the Grampians, you know, that's not too far away in terms of distance and a fairly similar environment. But we're working on this continuation of an ongoing monitoring program, which will allow us to compare a few years going back of data to ongoing what we find specifically. I guess, I guess the point of me asking that is that the, it, there's a whole lot of projects that are small and very limited in scale, but as so many of us know that cats are such a major effect on the populations of um, birds, mammals, reptiles. Without large-scale studies, which are hugely expensive, it's really difficult to draw all the threads together. So when you get to the end of your project, and it's got how long to go? I'll be finishing up in November, so about five or six months left. Okay. So what are you hoping will be the the sort of effects or the how, how do you think you'll be able to inform? That's probably a better question. How, how do you hope that your results will inform the management decisions that can be taken in the National Park of the Grampians? Yeah. So with the fox diet stuff, Despite, we've, they've been doing fox control in the Grampians since about 1997, and that was in response to a decline in a particular wallaby species. Uh, they don't have particularly good evidence of what the effects of that has been, whether it's been successful in protecting native species. They've got some limited evidence, but what the fox diet information will show 
is exactly which species they're preying on. Now, in Victoria, we know that a lot of fox diet is sheep, rabbits, and house mice, none of which are native. And if we discover that they're feeding primarily on those species, then we might realize that they're not having as great an impact on native species as we thought, so that control might not necessarily be needed everywhere in the park, or it might need to be as an intensive or could be targeted in areas where those species don't exist. We could also find that they have the what they call the critical weight range mammals, some of these really endangered species that are particularly at threat from cats and foxes. If they're appearing in the diet, then that would really raise some alarm bells. Say so We'd also potentially be able to see where those exist in the park based on where they're turning up in fox cats. So we can say, we know these species are here. We know they're being eaten by foxes. Therefore, that's somewhere we might need to focus our attention. Um, there's also potential to look at different areas of the park. So you might have the fox boundary might be of the national park might be going into the neighboring farms and feeding on rabbits and sheep, whereas those at the interior might be feeding on native species that are more vulnerable. So you could say we might not need as much targeted fox control at the boundary, but we can really put our efforts and our time and money into those central areas and protect the native species there. So it could really help target and help us understand what's at risk and then where we should be targeting our efforts. With the cat control, the bait being used here is Curiosity, which is fairly newly developed. It's mainly just been trialled at the moment around Australia. And this is one of the first uses in Victoria following the trial phase. And we'll be able to look at the whether there's a change in occupancy and where cats are found and give a basic indication or at least some indication of whether that's been an effective control tool and whether it's something that might be used going forward. What can you tell us about the curiosity bait? I, I know nothing about it. So is it a pheromone? Is it a manufactured food? Is it, What is it? So curiosity consists of a sausage made of kangaroo meat is about 70 percent some flavor enhancers to make it appealing to the cats and some chicken fat and then they put inside the bait a small plastic pellet that contains this poison this relatively humane poison called papp and the reason it's been designed that way is that this reduces the risk to non-target species so the way cats eat they break their food up into chunks, but they don't chew it, and then they'll swallow it down whole. So they're likely to consume that pellet containing the poison, which will then dissolve in their stomach and kill them relatively humanely. For most native species, because they eat it in a slightly different way, they're likely to come across this hard pellet in their food and think, that's not right, spit it out and reject it. So there's no risk to them. There is some risk to lizards. Lizards will take these baits sometimes with the pellets, but then you can counteract that, at least in southeast Australia, by only doing the baiting during winter when the lizards are not particularly active. One of the reasons I wanted to, to speak to you, Robin, is that you're, you're doing your project almost entirely within the period of the, the COVID lockdown and then the, the distancing and you haven't been able to get out in, into the field. So how have you had to change your methodology as a result of that? Are, are you still – you're getting the samples collected by Parks Vic staff, which is, which is great cooperation, and then you're sending the, the scats off to, off to Dr Scat – I'd love to know how you become a scat doctor, a scat expert, but I'm guessing there's there's probably a real lag in collecting that data back for you. So have you had to change the design of the project and are you going to be on under real pressure as you get towards November to actually get your results collated and, and out in time? It's definitely made it a more complicated process. I've been incredibly lucky. I know a lot of the people doing field work, particularly honor students, because they're working on a one-year time frame, have been really affected by COVID with regards to field work. But I've just been incredibly lucky to have the partners out in Parks Victoria who are keen to see this project go ahead and help out. 
So like I say, I haven't been able to go out in the field. The Parks Victoria staff helped out by setting out camera traps for me. And then as they're going about their work in the park, they're collecting scats opportunistically. We did have an issue where we suddenly realised there were a lot less scats out in the park than we expected. We were expecting them to be fairly easy to find along the tracks and trails around the Grampians, particularly given we know that foxes remain widespread in the park and that they preferentially move along tracks and trails. That's where you're most likely to find them on our cameras. But we weren't having many scats turn up, so we had to shift things about and look into alternatives. So we've changed. People are collecting them uh, sporadically as they find them along the tracks. And we have looked into the possibility of getting a scat detection dog out there as well. But yeah, luckily for me, I might get out into the field later this year. We're looking at the possibility that I'll spend a few days out there doing some kind of intensive scat searching, although that all depends on how things go with restrictions here in Victoria. Which Where do you get a scat detection dog? There is, so we've been speaking to someone who's worked with Phillip Island Nature Parks. They've uh, got a dog that's been trained to find fox scats. I believe they used it previously in out in a bushfire affected area so they could look at the effect of foxes after that. I think they've also been used out in the Otway Ranges. They've done a lot of work with fox scats there, looking at DNA in them actually to look at population sizes. Yeah, it's just really lucky that we've got that here in Victoria. We've got a few different conservation dog projects going on in Australia at the moment. We're really lucky that there are people who've put in the time and effort to train dogs to detect scents of things like fox scats and threatened species. Having the scats being examined by a, a different a different organisation, a different body, does that hold back the progress of the project? Have you Are you getting preliminary results along the way? We don't have any results yet. It is making it a little bit difficult, having not been out in the field and seen it myself, but what it is giving me lots of time to do is delve back into the history of cat baiting and fox diet studies around Australia. So I've been going through recently all the past trials of this curiosity bait and looking at where they've been successful, where they haven't been as successful, and what factors have been at play. So then when I get my own results back, whether that it shows that the baiting trial has been successful or not in reducing cat numbers in the Grampians, I'll be able to say these are the factors that could have made it successful or factors that might have meant it's not as successful. So it's given me lots of time to think about the context, look into all the other great work that other people have been doing. And yeah, hopefully I'll have results in a couple of months' time. Let's talk about the, the foxes again for a minute. From the work that's been done previously, what are you expecting to find? There's a few ways it could go. So I think there's a fairly decent chance that foxes, at least around the boundary of the park, are going to be feeding on rabbits, sheep, maybe mice, as a large portion of their diet. There's also quite a decent chance that they'll be feeding on some of the more common, less vulnerable native species, things like your swamp wallaby, your redneck wallaby, I think. And I'm just really interested to find out whether the critical weight range mammals, things like your southern brown bandicoot, are turning up. Because if they turn up, that'll give us a really good indication of whether they're at threat. But it's really hard to say. Now, let's just pretend that I don't know what you mean by critical weight range mammal. <laughs> and <laughs> yeah, that's so the critical range, as they, weight range, as they call it, falls between 35 grams and five and a half kilograms. So it's your intermediate sized mammals, not your really big stuff like your kangaroos and not your really tiny stuff. And it's basically they're the ones that have repeatedly been seen to be at the highest risk of extinction and the greatest threat from foxes and cats. So, and I think that's generally to do with the idea but that being that the really small stuff can hide away and are really hard to catch or not worth catching. And then the larger stuff just become too difficult for a fox or a cat to have a go. So in layman's terms, it's it's just the preferred tucker. It, 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 it's your cheeseburger cheeseburger to Big Mac kind of meal. It's it, it's it's not your triple whopper and and, and, and it's not your it's not your one dollar serve chips or whatever. Now I'm interested in how you would define 
how you would define success in the control of the cat population. Do you make that assessment only by the by the results of the images on the camera traps? That's all we will be looking at. It's a good point that we're only going to be looking at one measure, this occupancy, seeing whether or not they're turning up at the same sites, um, whether there's a reduction in the number of sites they're turning up at. One of the things with evaluating predator control programs is really the very best measure would be to look at the populations of the prey because we don't do these lethal control programs or any control programs because we we hate cats or we hate foxes. We do it because we want to protect these native species that are at threat. So ideally, yeah, your very best evidence will be, is it helping native species? In the absence of that, we just want to see, yeah, whether it's controlling the population and hopefully this will give some sort of, our work will give some sort of preliminary indication of whether that's the case and whether it's something worth looking into in the future. After you've completed this project, and I'm going to make the assumption that you that you do a, a stellar job and, and, and graduation occurs, and who knows, there might even be a ceremony by then. Roman, that would, <laughs> that would be great. What, what's the next step that you're hoping for? Are you wanting to continue work in the field with the mammals, or have you got something else in mind? At the moment, it really feels there's a lot of options open to me. I think at this stage, it would be nice to look into doing further research in this area. Like I said, there's a lot of things that we still don't know, even out in the Grampians with regards to foxes and cats. It's the sort of thing that if they, the opportunity came up, there would be definitely room to for someone to do a project out there looking at things like the exact cat populations and the home ranges and the effects that baiting has on the prey species. So it's something that I would certainly keep in mind. Otherwise, I'll just see what opportunities come up for me. I'm open to doing something else with predators and mammals, but just anything in ecology could take my interest and I'll keep an eye out for what comes up. Depending on the outcomes of this review uh, into feral cats, there might be all sorts of projects uh, popping up. So fingers crossed. Good luck with that. Now, Robin, uh, this program is generally about birds but you're working on a, uh, on a project that's going to have a big effect on birds. Do you class yourself as a bird nerd? Oh, definitely, 100%. Um, I'm definitely, definitely studying mammals, but birds are definitely a passion of mine. When was it that you became aware of being that special class of person, the, the bird nerd? Was it really early on in, in childhood or did it hit you a bit later on as, as a result of a, a sort of broader interest in ecology? I think I've always had an interest in nature and the outdoors, but my real interest in birds has only really come into fruition in the last couple of years. During my first year at uni, I decided to have a little go at some bird photography. I'd seen people online doing bits of bird and nature photography and I figured I'd give it a go. So I borrowed my dad's camera and started taking pictures, and then it snowballed from there. Now, I'm, I know you've listened to to a few of our earlier episodes, Robin, the hard-hitting, con- controversial journalism style that I'm into. What's your favourite field guide of choice? Field guide of choice. I always go back to the, the new CSIRO, the big blue book, I forget the exact name of it, Field Guide to Birds of Australia, I think it is, or... No particular reason for that preference, but that's what I use. And w- when you're out in the field, are you, are you using apps as well, or is it always the bound copy of the book? No apps as well, yes. I used to make a lot of use when I was first starting of the Field Guide to Victoria Museum Victoria app. It's particularly good because it's got the bird calls built in, but recently I've been using Merlin more, the Merlin Bird ID yeah, that's really come a long way, hasn't it? That's a good, uh, that's a good one. Apart from the apps, Robin, what what's your favourite piece of equipment when you're out in in the field? The obvious answer is usually binoculars, but is there is there something else that you rely on all the time when you're out either working or birding for pleasure? I always have my camera on me when I'm out birding. 
like I say, it was bird photography that kind of led me into really getting interested in birds. So even when I'm just out walking my dog in the neighborhood, I'll always bring the camera with me just in case I see something out and about. Okay, so let's geek out. What's your photography rig? It is actually my dad's old camera, and it's a Sony A100, I think it is. And I've got this big, not a huge lens, but I think it's a 300mm lens, so I can get a bit of a close-up shot on some stuff. So it's always nice. Veering off from the usual pathway we take here, what's the, what do you consider the best shot you've taken with your photography rig? I It can be pretty hard to get shots out in the field. I've got some nice shots I got last year. I was really lucky. Last year I was living in student accommodation in Melbourne near Royal Park. So I was visiting, heading down to the wetlands there, which are a great birding spot, often a few times a week last year. and. One day I was down there and as I was walking down the path, a couple of people came along with binoculars and pointed out to me that there was a pink robin in the park and they just missed it. It just disappeared for them. But I hung around and sure enough, a few minutes later, a rose robin appeared next to the path and it sat around for about half an hour flitting between the same couple of trees. And I just spent the whole time flicking away and grabbing some shots. So I think that's maybe one of my favourite experience it's maybe not my best shot but one of my best experiences taking photos of birds i think i think i know the answer to the next question but you're an immersive experiential bird watcher rather than a ticker and flicker i'm guessing yeah i'm not one to say no to trying to go out and see a rare bird if it shows up near me but i'm also just as happy to watch a magpie putter around the garden doing its thing or get out into the bush and just watch the little bush birds flutter around. It's always nice to see a rare or a new species, but just watching the fairy wrens and the fantails in the local bit of bushland is just as good to me. Are you maintaining a list? I've tried to get into it a little bit more recently. I didn't used to keep a list as such. I'm trying to get into eBird um, and put my records on there. So they at least count for something in the citizen science context as well. But I'm still quite new to that, so still finding my feet with it. Yeah, yeah, but it it seems like a, a, a pretty strict delineation between the people who maintain lists and can tell you the number and their of their life list and of their of their tribe list. <laughs> but you're definitely not in that camp, so you're definitely down one end of, one end of the spectrum. You mentioned your favourite experience with the camera have you got a favorite bird like they say it's like trying to make me pick a favorite child or something but i'm gonna make you do it it could probably vary from day to day i think at the moment it has to be the yellowtailed black cockatoo they're just so big and magnificent and they've got such a personality and i don't see them very often but i see them often enough that it's that special experience that i get to happen occasionally when i stumble across a flock Last year, I was living near Prince's Park in Melbourne, and I would occasionally see them fly through the park. And it's just wonderful to see a big, exotic-looking bird like that flying through, essentially, inner-city Melbourne. And, yeah, I was lucky enough to see my local flock. I'm down on the Mornington Peninsula now. I was lucky enough to see a local flock of mine recently, so I've been keeping my eye down here as well. But, no, I think they're, at the moment, my favourite. That's pretty groovy now. Is there a bird that you've got on on a wish list or on a bucket list that before your time is done, you really want to see it? I really would love to see either of the two parrots that migrate back and forth to Tasmania. So the orange-bellied parrot or the swift parrot. I've yet to get a chance to have a look at them. I did go looking for a swift parrot when they turned up in Royal Park a few weeks ago, but no luck. So either of those two are pretty high on the list for me. I just think they're quite magnificent and also, sadly, critically endangered. It would be quite special to see them. I I concur. Yeah, the, the, the swift parrot's an extremely uh, sad story, I think, because when I was your age, back in the dark ages, they weren't common, but it wasn't unusual to see reports of them being seen uh, in Melbourne and certainly in the northern parts of their range when they were wintering in melbourne or in, in, 
on the mainland. It wasn't uncommon to hear of them being seen at all, but no, it's a, it's a tragedy and the, the recovery team are doing the best job they can. Hopefully they can really have some wins. Let's let's get a bit more up, upbeat. Where's your favourite place to go and uh, and experience the bird watching? Ooh. At the moment, down on the Mornington Peninsula, I've been heading to the Briars Little Reserve down here because I can get to it nice and easily, wander down and have a look around. And then Royal Park is always going to have kind of a special place in my heart. Like I say, I spent a lot of time up there last year and just down around those wetlands lands you're right in the middle of melbourne and the stuff that turns up there or even just the the honey eaters there all year round it's quite special same question about the birds have you got a a place that you know you're always dreaming about tossing and turning on those baking hot winter nights baking hot summer nights and and going oh i can't wait to get to borneo or the antarctic or the tundras of siberia where where's somewhere you're really dreaming about going one day i've got two answers actually i've got close to home i've got the western treatment plant here in melbourne where we have all the migratory birds and the interesting shorebirds and ducks and stuff turn up i had planned to try and get out there this year i finally got my driver's license at the start of this year and i was making plans to get my permit and drive out there and see what i could see because it's got this such a great rec- reputation as a place to see birds in Melbourne. And then COVID came along and people haven't been out there for a while, but fingers crossed I'll actually be able to get out there soon. And then a little bit further afield, I would love to actually go out and bird in New Zealand, which is perhaps not as exciting as some of the places you listed overseas, but I'd love to go out and see Kias and Kakapos and some of the other really unusual, interesting species they have over there. Because in some ways it's so similar to Australia. They've got some overlap with things like the fantails and their swamp hen type species, but also just some really weird, interesting, unique birds. Keep keep your eyes out for the future episode where I spoke with Scott Mowat, who has made two films about the Kakapo and the Takahe. So... No, you should enjoy that. I learned a lot, and and I've certainly got New Zealand on my wish list, and the the Tui, and as you, as you mentioned, the fantails there. They've got the the best looking shags. <laughs> it's a, yeah, but sadly, invasive species have predators have have made a mess there, and and many of our Australian species are causing havoc there. Possums. Yeah, so, it's yeah. quite funny to think we always think of. Australia is a kind of a land beset by invasive species, or at least that's the way you see it in my mind. And then you realise that our species have been carried overseas as well and are doing their own damage. Being a our youngest, a youngest participant in in the bird emergency so far, Robin, I think we can stretch your horizon out fairly fairly far. Where, where would you like to see yourself in the scientific slash academic slash birding world in let's give you a 10-year horizon 10 years from now Ooh, i'm not sure i wonder if a phd might be something to happen in the next 10 years and then it would just be a case of seeing what opportunities come up and what takes my interest i think i would be interested in having a look at academia and carrying on with predator-based work or even looking at some bird stuff but that's also very hard to get into by all accounts so just somewhere in australia working on native species conservation of some sort i think hopefully something that gets me back out into the field no specific plans but working in the same sort of area i i really wanted to speak to you because the the difficulties that are confronting you in completing just your honors year, i think of how have been really major and good on you for finding a workaround to enable the the project to, to go ahead. And I really wish you luck with getting it completed by November. And would that put you in a December graduation or would you be looking at it's, it's generally March, is it? I don't actually know. Um, 
just all focused on that November deadline at the moment. Yeah, I haven't looked at that far ahead. That's that's fair enough. Robin, if people want to follow you and follow your work, what should they do? The best place to keep up to date with what I'm up to is probably Twitter. I'm at Robin SCI. I put bird pic- pictures up on Instagram as well under the same handle. But if you want to follow my work, Twitter is the place to be. Now, Robin, I hope that you will let listeners experience some of your fan- fantastic photographic exploits and and send a couple to me that I can put on the on the page with the post and yeah, show us a bit of your either your exceptional photographic prowess or just your yeah, exquisite choice of the subject matter. Either way. Happy to. No worries. That would be great. Robin, thanks for taking part, and I wish you all the best in your future studies and, of course, in your ongoing enjoyment of the wonderful Feathered Friends. Thank you very much. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed uh, Robin's story. Uh, No doubt I'll be catching up with Robin now that the project has been completed, he has been successful and we can catch up on what he's doing next. Now, just to give you a little teaser, uh, the next two episodes, Mark Holdsworth, uh, a name that will be very familiar to many in conservation circles in Australia, and perhaps a bit more widely in uh, in the Pacific area, we'll be talking mostly about dogs. And Mark and his partner are uh, in, uh, intricately involved in producing conservation dogs. And then following Mark, I was speaking about the Kakapo and the Takahay with Scott Mowat in New Zealand, a documentary maker and a committed conservationist who really can tell us a little bit about the um, the framework for conserving those two species in New Zealand. Now, finally, if you are looking for more to listen to in your podcast ears, check out climactic.fm. Climactic is a show all about climate change and the people uh, working to arrest it. And there's sort of a network around Climactic as well. So I recommend that you dip in and see if you can find something you like. Climactic.fm. I'm Grant Williams. I'll see you next time. Thanks for lending me your ears.